Hi, my name is Albert Lin, and I'm here to talk about where the diversity in cultures really come from. You know, I've, I've had the honor of traveling the world from jungle to jungle, from desert to desert, from mountain to mountain, and I think the thing that really gets me is the enigma of what are the origins in imagination. So good evening and welcome. So tonight we've, this is the last of this year's series of Darwin College lectures. Over the last two months, our lecturers have been exploring many aspects of the theme of enigmas. Exploring, well explorers are a fairly rare species today, I think. One day someone may set forth for the moon or Mars or to peek under the cloud veil of Venus, but for now, we can simply view a satellite image online and see almost anywhere on any continent or on some other planets. It wasn't always so, though. Discovering what is out there has always been a driving, almost enigma for human society. What, what is discovery? Is it informing the collective human mind so that we can all know? It's to add to the collective human knowledge. If you think about explorers in history, they set out to go beyond the known, or their known, further south, north, east, west, higher, deeper, across mountains, over oceans, through deserts, to see what was there. But today, you know, we have better maps of the surface of the moon or Mars than we do of the bottom of the ocean. The ocean depths may remain largely incognito, the French undersea explorer Jacques Cousteau sparked my childhood interest. Ultimately, that led me to be on, on a small research ship in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, putting instruments down on the seabed in three kilometers of water in order to find a postulated magma chamber beneath the plate boundary that separates uh, Europe and North America. Guess what? It wasn't there. New hypothesis required. Now, back in the 4th century BCE, the written shared community of knowledge was really searching out from Greece and Persia and India and China. And one individual, Pythias, set sail from the Mediterranean. And he went northwest to discover an island he called Britannica. And even further, past the land of darkness, Scotia, to discover the Orcas Islands and then probably on to Greenland. So he added Britain to the collective knowledge, effectively our discoverer. But why did he go? Maybe he sought riches, tin in Cornwall perhaps, but maybe his reason was more like George Mallory's climbing Everest, because it's there. So what, what is an explorer to do now? Are explorers teetering on extinction? Are they a new red list species? How does technology bring new insight and questions? Can we explore the essence of humanity? So tonight, please welcome the explorer and broadcaster, so Dr. Albert Lynn who's going to talk to us about, no title, Archaeological Mysteries. I think it's Archaeological Mysteries. Anyway, <laughs> Albert. Thank you very We're much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Master. That was, um, I think you should do the whole thing, actually, because that was, that was so eloquent. Thank you all for braving, uh, braving coronavirus to be here. I know. Um, it was, I was actually saying it's, it's, it's a bit ironic considering this is the Darwin Lecture Series and it might not be serving our, our, <laughs> our deepest survival interest to be in this room right now. <laughs> but we're here. We're here, so let's do this. And I promise I'm not going to talk about corona anymore. Uh, you know, I have to say it was a lot more terrifying for me to come here than I think most other talks. 
been a bit of a challenge trying to think about how to compose this. I'm not an archaeologist. Uh, it may have been mentioned. I'm, a, I'm an engineer. I'm an engineer. Uh, and somehow, over the last decade, I've had this incredible experience where the projects that I've done uh, and then the things that, that I've led to have combined engineering and storytelling to the point in which I've had this incredible honor of just bouncing around the globe nonstop, uh, meeting people that are doing some incredible things and then applying technology maybe to see if we can push the frontier just a little bit further. You know, just for example, maybe it was about three weeks ago that I was standing at the base of this pyramid in Mexico which rises out of the jungle, uh, you know, like, like, a, like an arm reaching for the sky. If anybody's been in the jungle, it's a hard place to be. You, know, you, really, uh, you really do feel the presence of everything trying to kill you. <laughs> it's, it's snakes, it's killer bees, it's a wasp that if it stings you, it'll paralyze your lungs. It's just the, the pounding heat and humidity that, uh, that I think you either hate or you love. You know, there's a bit of you that loves it. And I was there with uh, these two archaeologists, Dr. Francesco Estradabali and the site director, Sandra Valenzario. Uh, and what they've been doing there for the last couple of years has been pretty remarkable. Finding things within these pyramids that you, you wouldn't quite expect that might shift your understanding of how a civilization like the Maya might have operated. They let me go into the top of this pyramid. There's only two pyramids that have been found so far which have uh, ancient Maya channels that enter in through the top of these pyramids. And when you pull back the little grate at the top, you end up going down deeper into, they send you down into this hole. And as, as I'm descending into the hole, uh, Francisco mentions that there's not so many pleasant things down there, possibly, just to watch out for the, the possibility of a fair to land snake, because uh, they hadn't been in there in about a year. Does anybody know about the fair to land snake? You've got a 50 50 chance of living even with the antivenom. Uh, and they try not to give it to you because the antivenom itself is sometimes more dangerous than the bite. So it's not good. As we're heading in, this is what it feels like. It's like a mini whip scorpion. I'm coming. That's my sound recordist, uh, Simon, who's uh, going further and further into the channel as we're descending down ancient Mayan staircases. And, uh, and if you could hear what he's saying, I'll, I'll, he's, he's identifying a mini whip scorpion. Oh, good, right? This is what I feel like. Okay. must be, it's got to be down there somewhere or on the camera. Just seriously, turn the camera around, please. It's slowly. There's a scorpion issue going on. We're trying to clear deep in the heart of the burial chamber. And um, the other challenge is that we all had beans for the last three days because yeah, we're in Mexico. So in the hottest, muggiest place I've ever been, everyone is farting. Scorpions and farts. Awesome. That's exploration, right? Yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was rough. You're down in a tiny little cramped corner, and all of a sudden, you're sitting there face to face uh, with the ancient chamber of a queen's burial. Uh, you know, surrounded by scorpions, of course. Uh, but, but it's remarkable, the feeling you get when you're, when you're just past the veil, when you're, when you're there in a moment where you feel like you're, uh, you're, you're touching something sacred at the very limits of human imagination. We were using technology like LIDAR, interior LIDAR, to try to scan the inside of those chambers and then come out and build a 3D model where you can imprint the interior structure of the pyramid inside the exterior model that we've created and try to see whether or not we've hit bedrock. Uh, and we hadn't, which means that there might be another tomb further down beneath. And then that was, what, that was maybe, I think, less than three weeks ago that I left there and then and then I headed off to Peru. So just last week, I was uh, at a site that's called Chan Chan, which means sun sun. Uh, it's on the coast of Peru in a desert. It's a remarkable place. It's, they think it's actually one of the largest uh, adobe cities, or cities in general, uh, in, in the pre-Columbian world. Uh, and, and it's just this place that sort of 
has melted away over time, but once housed a vast empire before the Inca. And I was there, uh, you know, and this, this time was something like around, I think it started around 850 AD and got to right before the Spaniards arrived uh, and then the Inca took it out. Uh, but at, at its height, it had 40 to 60,000 people in it. And at that time, that was more than were here in London uh, at the time. So when you go around and you walk through those city halls, you start to feel something. You start to see this sort of image of what daily life might have been like. What are those weird little things down there? They're not fish. They're actually, uh, they explained to me that they're, they're images of little pelicans. You can see the nose sticking out and the eye in the middle in these very kind of strange shapes. And then the walls have just sort of crumbled away with the rains. Right outside of, of Chan Chan, which is supposedly the sixth driest city in the world, or near there, the neighboring city, uh, is, something, is something quite gruesome, actually. You know, the world there was one that was imagined out of a connection to the natural world. Everything was about the natural world, right? They're living in an incredibly arid, dry place. There's these really intense anomaly, anomalies, these possible rains. They, you know, everything is based off of their understanding of their relationship to what's happening around them. They're using what they see around them to try to connect to nature. There's a deep culture that was based and still is based in, in using plant medicines to try to connect to the spirits of the natural world, plants like San Pedro cactus. Uh, which is a uh, entheogen, a term that's been coined by a group of people, maybe not, not more than 20 or 30 years ago, Carl Ruck and others from Brown, to describe the use, the cultural use through time of hallucinogenic plants, uh, you know, to, to try to understand our, how we've used those as human beings through time. And still today, everywhere you go, people are talking about a connection to the San Pedro uh, in Peru. It's been described as something that sets you free from matter. And for the chimu, they would drink it out of a, a drink that they called chimora uh, and, and during every full moon. It was a full moon thing because they worshiped the moon. Uh, and when their lives changed for whatever reason, they had to try to figure out how to stop the change because they needed to try to figure out how to return balance to their world. And just recently, right, side, right, right, right outside of the walls of Chan Chan, uh, they found the remains of what they think to now be the world's largest child human sacrifice. Uh, you can see the skull of a young child that I'm holding. It's actually not a regular shaped skull. It's been, it's been modified, uh, as is the tradition in the Amazon, actually, where uh, they've put uh, you know, a, a metal board on top of this child's head over time and they created this, this shape that might have been more culturally pleasing. Uh, but these kids came from all over the place, this, this one moment. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't necessarily, well, we don't know if they are brought by force or not, but apparently, based off of what they've been able to study from the bones and from uh, the matter around their bellies, is that they were all eating the same thing for about three months before they were led to their death. Uh, and then there was a systematic killing. Uh, there was a, um, this incredible knife that was found, this blade. That, uh, that they showed me, where, um, where it still has the beads inside it at the end of its rattle. And the rattle signifies the sound of death. And as this archaeologist was showing me the sound of this rattle, you could actually hear the sound, the last sound that those children heard before their chest was cut open and their hearts were ripped out. Because you can actually see those systematic cut marks on all 137 skeletons that were found in this one pit, in this one moment. Now, what was that for? Why did, they, why did they all go to that end? What do we do in the, human, the extreme ends of our human nature? It's, it's hard to say, but there's a, a theory by an anthropologist named Hagen Klaus that it might have had something to do with the changing weather, El Nino events. Uh, you know, they couldn't deal with these massive floods that came through. And if anybody's been following the news about Peru right now, just a week after, actually two days after I left that lab, uh, massive floods with an El Nino rushed through and, uh, and caused incredible havoc. I think it killed actually four people uh, in neighboring streets of southern Peru. Where can you find evidence for this? T 
two days later, we're at 17,200 feet of elevation. That's roughly 5,250 meters, uh, which is a fast jump. My, uh, my father's friend, Sparrow, a climber, would know that you're not supposed to go that high that quickly. <laughs> it's not a good idea. Uh, but up there, high up in those mountains, you see those lines in the glacier? This is the fastest retreating, well, it's one of the fastest retreating glaciers in the world, but it's one of the only tropical glaciers uh, or a handful of tropical glaciers that still sort of exist. They say it's retreating at a rate of almost 20 meters per year. Uh, but with its retreat is a book of knowledge because within each one of those tiny layers might be a clue about an ancient climate. Uh, there's ice coring that's been going on for several years. There's uh, uh, Lonnie Thompson from Ohio State who's been leading these ice core initiatives way up high up in the Andes and actually around the world. And, you know, it's hard. This is my, uh, my colleague and director, Jim, who upon getting up there just all of a sudden couldn't take it anymore and had to, you know, really had to breathe the oxygen. As he did that, our mountain guide handed him a bunch of coca leaves, uh, which you're supposed to chew to deal with the altitude. And then he blew three times into the wind uh, in every direction. These coca leaves laid out in a pair of three uh, as an offering to the Apus, the mountains around him. This is ancient traditional uh, knowledge from, uh, you know, from uh, his parents and his parents before them and before them and before them. Uh, you know, spoken in words that are spoken by the Inca, the Quechua. But as we're up there, we get little bits of ice. And if you look at the little Pispisky. bubbles, those little bubbles, those little teeny bubbles, those bubbles were trapped there when those layers of ice were formed. And you know, as you go further down those layers, you go further down in time. And that bubble might have not been released for 5,000 years. When you crack it open, it smells fresh. It's nice. Uh, but within that is knowledge, information, chemical information that they could use to gleam what it was like in that area. And sure enough, right around the time of that massacre, there was these massive El Nino events uh, that would wipe through uh, and possibly wipe out that city. This has been, uh, I would say, an incredible month. But over the last year, it's been even crazier. I've gone all over the world. This is my crew and I on top of a mountain in Jordan, in a place called Wadi Rum. Has anybody here been to Wadi Rum? Yeah, it's a enchanting place. It's hard to describe it in any other way. Uh, but people have lived there for thousands of years. Bedouin, you know? Eventually the Nabataeans that would go on and build something like Petra. But the Bedouin, they still live there. Uh, and there is a researcher Mohamed Domian, who together with a group of GIS scientists from around the world, from Arizona, from Queens College, from others, have been using something they call the Rock Art Sustainability Index, or RASI, to try to start to go and catalog what they're seeing on the walls from their ancient ancestors using a crowdsourced approach, just using simple cell phones everywhere they go, because they live out there, with, uh, with the GPS on the cell phone and creating a big catalog of this library written on the rocks, this library of information, traces of human thought, maybe early developments of the alphabet, this Thamudic alphabet, which some of these markers, they still make sounds that are used today, like that little triangle is actually branded on the side of the camels that sat in the camp uh, next to us, and they, made it, they said it made it sound like an auger sound or something like this, but the, it's, this is stuff from an, an inhabitation across the region that dates back 10,000 years or more. Uh, and now, today, with cell phones, these Bedouins are running around cataloging where they all are, and creating a map of ancient knowledge, crowdsourced uh, out of low-tech devices already in their pockets. These same people would go on to become the Nepotians that would build Petra, Amazing Petra. And at first, you see Petra, and you're like, man, that's amazing. It really is. But imagine it when it was there. It was blue and yellow. It was painted in different colors. It was influenced from 
interactions they had from all around the world. Uh, and then what you don't see until you get up on top, which you're not allowed to do unless you're filming there, which is what we've been able to do is get this crazy access, is that on the top of each of those roofs are these little catchments. It's all catchments. It's all a bunch of pools. The whole thing looks pretty, but actually it's this incredible network of water catchments. And they all feed down into these underground cisterns that still fill with water today. So the whole thing has these channels that run through the sides of it, fa the faces of this stone wall, and, and they feed down into these underground pools. And that's how these, in fact, if you look at the whole city of Petra, it's just one huge bowl feeding down into these cisterns in the middle. Uh, and it's remarkable. It's beautiful, but it's remarkable as an engineering feat. Incredible. Not so far away, I was in, I was in, uh, the Rift Valley with uh, Dr. Rebetel Bookman, a geologist from Hoffa University. And she's looking at these settlements the same way that Lonnie Thompson was looking at the glaciers, using it as a record. But not only a record of what got deposited there, but, but the, the geological violence across the region. These deposited layers were created with these flash flood events through the desert. And then you can see those swirling patterns. She calls them uh, laustrin sediments. And, and they're related to specific earthquakes that she can then use radiocarbon dating to see where it's in the sediments and see when earthquakes happened across the region. And if anybody knows the Rift Valley in Jordan, uh, it's where the tectonic plates are literally ripping themselves apart. Earthquakes. Massive earthquakes. You have, you have the whole thing sitting on uh, this salt diaper. So when you look at the Dead Sea, uh, you actually have these moments where bits of tar, big chunks of tar would float up to the surface uh, at random times because there's tar trapped underneath the Dead Sea. In fact, that's what the Nebateans used to trade a lot of, actually. They'd bring the, they, there was these descriptions of taking like black cows of tar and fishing them out of, the, out of the Dead Sea back in the day. That's, imagine that. But also imagine the stories that were generated out of a series of phenomena that you couldn't quite explain thousands of years ago. Imagine why, how you would come up with explanations for that. Think about where many of the stories that led to the three monotheistic religions today are really originated from. They originated out of one of the most geologically violent places in the world. Something there, right? Maybe there's some part of that that had to do with how we explain the phenomena around us. Not so long after that, I was up in the Arctic Circle with Yad Magnus, looking at 6,000 rock carvings that date from around 500 BC to 420 BC. He uses that, this, this process called shoreline dating to figure out how old they are. Uh, it's a site called Alta. And what he explained to me here was that, th that they would use the grooves of these stones and the movements and the actual pools that you see around us to create a three-dimensional topographical map that then they would place their existing world on top of, kind of like he described it as a Google Earth, but from ancient times. You see a bear there. You see reindeer. You see these images. Now, at first, you think, well, what is this? Is this a procession, a line? What is that? And then you look a little closer, and he describes to me, you see that man up there with an arrow, a bow and arrow? And it's pointing straight up. And it looks like that man right in the middle, the third person over, gets hit with something. Jan's theory is that this is, this is a creationist story, where we come from the reindeer, we live our life, we die, and we become reindeer again. You know, that's, just, that's quite remarkable. What really struck me was this image. I mean, what's going on there? Uh, you've got a boat, a really, really, really long fishing line, and then what looks to be like a massive halibut at the bottom. I mean, you're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. We're talking about the Mesolithic era. First of all, how did they figure out how to make a line that could hold a huge, massive halibut? Well, they might, okay, they could figure it out, maybe sinew, that sort of thing. Second of all, how did they just sort of stumble across the idea that there was going to be this monster fish at the bottom of the ocean that they could then figure out how to trick on dividing this line that they would pull up with a huge fight and then feed their family? How did all that just sort of 
come about, that knowledge. That to me is this thing that at first I thought was remarkable, and then I just realized that it's only remarkable because I take for granted how much I learn from what I have around me now. You know, I, I see the world that I have around me now, but, but what really struck me was who came up with the first idea to do that? Where did that idea come from? Somebody came up with that. That person was a genius. Then, from the Arctic, I'm down right in the middle of the Pacific. This is the island of Pompeii in Micronesia. Has anybody been to Micronesia? It's a long trip, I'll tell you that. It's in the middle of the ocean. There's no direct flights. Uh, there's, it's, like a, it's like a whole catalog of flights you gotta take to get there. Uh, but there, people have moved and lived over over a landscape that they don't describe as a landscape. Actually, it's, they call it Oceana, a connected peoples connected by the ocean. And there, you still see people living in this Polynesian sort of oceanic lifestyle, this Micronesian lifestyle, and you find these, these really strange pieces of rock art that are sort of similar, speckled across island to island, covering a massive, massive distance, dating back maybe 2,000 to 3,500 years old. These pieces of rock art that are found on this island are found all the way out in similar ways out in New Caledonia, which are literally on the other side of the Pacific, pretty much. Wow. Who imagined a voyage when they set sail, possibly from the Philippines, off into the horizon, with their people, and then said, you know what, follow me. We're gonna go try to find a new plot of land out in the middle of the ocean, maybe a, a, an island. We'll fish this island out of the sea. They call it fishing it out of the sea, these wayfinders. And there would be this, there's this story that Wade Davis talks about where you would have a captain and then a wayfinder, and the wayfinder literally had to do nothing else but just sort of sit there and meditate on where they had been, remembering all the moments and chart, the, the points of the sky as it passes over you through time and knowing where the stars are across a series of quadrants and having that entirely memorized in their mind as they're moving forward so they can know where they're going. Their entire belief system is one which is built upon knowing where you've been to describe where you're going. And when I ask anybody on that island about their origin story, about where that all began, they don't have an answer. They just say, we came from somewhere which is actually the only place I've ever heard that, because everybody else says we came from you know, uh, a cave or we came from the mountains, but to just say we came from another island somewhere and not really have a story before that is, is also pretty remarkable. So where am I going to with all this? This is about enigmas, right? And I'm getting behind here already. Uh, what I've seen in my travels has been that from ocean to ocean, from desert to desert, from jungle to jungle, from mountain to mountain, uh, there is a remarkable diversity in human culture, I mean, remarkable. There's a lot of similarities, you know, ecological conditions, the weather, what you have access to, that certainly drives similarities. But there's incredible diversity, too. Just look at jungle cultures, for example. They're very different from one to the other. I'd say so different that it, it, it inspires a sense of you know, a similar remembrance to what might have inspired Darwin, looking around, saying, What's this, where does all this diversity come from? And it's pretty remarkable, too, because it comes, it comes at a much faster rate. I mean, really, we all left Africa, as we all, I'm sure, have heard many times in this series, only roughly 60,000 years ago or so, maybe a little more. But at that point, we annealed down to a very, very small number of people. There was something that was going on. They think that it might have gotten down to less than 10,000 humans uh, that were really around at the time. And maybe the group that left uh, Africa was even as small as 150 humans based off of a sweeping genetic study that, uh, that Spencer Wells and others of the Genographic Project did. Now, from all that, we go around, we travel around, and then all of a sudden we, we experience the world around us, and yet, boom, there's this massive amount of diversity. Like I said, I think that similar to biology, it reflects an evolutionary process. See, this is where it got tricky for me, because I had to figure out how to speak to this incredible audience about something to do with Darwinism. And actually, it, uh, it forced me to really reflect on my entire experiences in life in a really meaningful way. 
because it's true that, that the things that I saw through all my travels did reflect an evolutionary process. Now, evolution is driven in part by some replicator criteria. I spent a lot of time this last week reading about evolution. I know the big debate now is, is there, is there you know, like a true aesthetic, maybe, that, that might be universal, that could lead to certain understanding about things like sexual selection, you know, the story of the bower birds and other things like this? Uh, well, we don't know, you know, I don't know. It's some combo of it all. Uh, there's also natural selection, you know, uh, this concept of survival of the fittest, that sort of thing, which we're not practicing right now by being in this room. Uh, but that's only one part of it, because the other part is this kind of magical thing. It's like, we, 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 it's taboo to say the word magic, but actually there's a bit of magic. This whole reshuffling, this mutation of a gene it happens all the time. It's random, supposedly. It's, it's what causes that? Where, 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 what? Philosophically, what causes that? So that's where I get to this big question. If cultures, genes, like Richard Dawkins says, with memes and that sort of thing, are just ideas, and of course we can talk about whether they get copied because they're, they're sexier or because they're more functional, all those different things are, are interesting things to look at. But if cultures, genes, are ideas, then what's the magic that creates original ideas? That first person to fish for the massive halibut. What gives birth to the diversity in culture around us today? The enigma, what are the origins of imagination? Where does that come from? Well, if you forgive me, I, I've, I've spent way more time than I thought I would on that original, that was supposed to be like five minutes as an intro. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to try to go fast now through my own personal story. Uh, I started out, my own inspiration, my own imagination was probably born out of being the son of an astrophysicist and a musician. Uh, I spent a couple of years here at Cambridge even. My, my father, Douglas Lynn, was a, uh, you know, a postdoc here and did his PhD here and then did sabbaticals here. Uh, and I would just take things apart all the time, stare, stare at microscopes and you know, just get interested in science. And before you knew it, I had a, a PhD in materials science. Nothing to do with being an explorer, but just a PhD in materials science. It's because it was fun, it was exciting, I was really interested in looking beyond the veil. But at the same time, I was so curious about my own ancestry, and I was so curious about the world at large and what it meant to be human, that I got super enamored with these specific individuals that, to me at the time, were so inspiring because they inspired some idea of, of charisma. I got really kind of crazy uh, about this story of Genghis Khan, and I decided right out of grad school I was going to launch this project to try to find uh, Genghis Khan's tomb using an engineering approach. And at the time, I was literally living on, uh, you know, ramen and out of the back of my car, uh, and, I, and I had a PhD, and that's it. Uh, but, but sometimes it's just like that big bold moment that actually leads you out into the thing that'll shift your world and. And my friends and my family, they all supported me to just be as crazy as I could be uh, and to follow those dreams. And I just started building this project one by one. I, I built it based off of an inspiration from a man I had met early on uh, in my grad days when I had been traveling around Mongolia, this man named Amra, who became my sworn blood brother. When I traveled to Mongolia, he started telling me about the story of Genghis Khan, but not through the story, uh, through the lens that I had read about in school the one that describes his life through the lens of his enemies, which is actually the only real historical record that still exists today because he didn't really even have a written record of his own life at his own time. It was just written by his enemies. But he tells this completely different story of an individual, Genghis Khan. I'm using this image to describe Genghis Khan, but this is actually an image of a friend of ours uh, as we stand on top of a sacred mountain at the edge of uh, the desert uh, to, at sunrise to try to ask for himr, or wind horse, the sacred power that has been something that's influenced the understanding of an individual in Mongolian history for, for thousands of years. Genghis Khan, on one hand, could be thought of as a 
intensely violent warrior. But on another hand, you've got to imagine, here's a person who had absolutely nothing. I mean, really. His father had been murdered. His uh, wife had been stolen by the enemies of his father. His horses had been taken from him. His own tribe had turned their back on him, and then he was sent off to die uh, into, the, into the forbidden, what is now the forbidden precinct, but into these mountains where you can't herd, where you can't really raise any cattle or sheep. And then he was sent off to this, to this place chased by his enemies, and he found solitude in a mountain, according to the one almost like uh, poetic version of Mongol history that survives, uh, where apparently he stood on top of that mountain, uh, and in that absolute low point of his life, for some reason, felt connected to a bigger destiny. And from that point forward, shifted the entire world that we know today. Because in a single lifetime, not only did he unite all the tribes that he had been living near, that had been fighting for thousands of years, but he also turned that tribe outward and created the largest contiguous empire in human history. With nothing more than 100,000 soldiers at its max. I mean, we're talking about taking down the million-man armies of, per of Persia. We're talking about creating an empire that went all the way from uh, you know, from the coast of Japan to uh, Poland. We're talking about a spread that far outbeats uh, Alexander the Great or the Romans, uh, but in a single lifetime with nothing more than what? Maybe charisma? What is that charisma? Now, to me, that's remarkable. Uh, that is very remarkable. I would also note that at that time, uh, you know, that globalization that occurred did lead to, and this is my only other mentioning of a plague again, uh, the, the possible trade, they think that the bubonic plague, which happened uh, here, obviously, uh, in the years that followed, was because of this opening of trade from east to west, uh, and you know that killed like half of Europe, so let's all be a little cautious about that. Uh, we don't know what happened to him. We don't know what he looked like. We don't know where he was buried. We don't know anything about him, because there's never been an actual physical artifact found related to Genghis Khan. So I decided to look in the one place that was forbidden to go to, this area in the northern part of Mongolia on the border of Russia and Mongolia called the Ikkorik. And, and it's been forbidden to go to by decree of Genghis Khan himself because any disturbing of this tomb would cause a curse, they said, right? So I decided to try to use something that I knew, technology. I decided to try to sift through massive amounts of satellite imagery data. As we mentioned, satellite imagery allows us to look at the world in an interesting way from above. But I had so much data, I didn't know how to even make sense of what to look for. So I, at the time, it was, I was getting inspired by things like this company called Foldit. This was building a video game to pro fold proteins. Uh, there was this lost explorer named Steve Fawcett, and, then, and he died in a plane crash. But they were looking for his plane crash using something called Mechanical Turk. Uh, and it, those things really inspired me. So we built a video game to get lots of people to help us search, uh, where we would get the satellite imagery, we'd, we'd cut it all up into little bits here and there, and then we'd ask lots of people online in parallel to look at the data, and then the only feedback they got wasn't what I said was right or wrong, because I didn't know what to look for. It was what they said to themselves. So they would see something, they would put a marker on it, they would commit their answers, and then the next thing they would see would be what everybody else had said about the same image. And over time, you'd get these trends that would emerge out of the statistical agreement across the board. And then we'd go out and we'd ride out on horseback and we'd go and try to find what they were looking for. And sure enough, we'd start to find things. This is a 3,000-year-old Bronze Age burial. Now, wow, people working together at scale. We had 18, uh, it was, uh, I think the added time online was 18 years of human effort just volunteered to us to sift through all that data. But the thing that got me then was that, and kept on being brought up, was that this was all about agreement because whoever randomly tagged the first image or that first bit of the data would then be the training data set for the next person. So over time, what people learned to agree upon collectively was really driven by who was there first. It wasn't driven by some true understanding of what was possibly in the image. It was, it was almost like if we started all over again, would we get totally different data every single time? This had to do with that question of where do new ideas come from in culture. But we used the statistical analysis, and we followed it to those anomalies as they presented themselves. And on the top of a mountain in the center of the Forbidden Precinct, we found this huge shaman shrine. Shamans are the only ones that are allowed to still go to this one area. And in the roots of the trees around the, the base of that mountain, uh, on the southeast side of that mountain, where the historical records 
uh, indicate there should be something related to Genghis Khan's death. Trees that had fallen down in the storms around me, I found the remains of something staring at me in my, my hand. What is this thing? And as I ran from tree root to tree root, you could, you could almost hear your feet crunching under you on the grass, like It's like nothing I've ever experienced before. This is my first time in the field. I've never, I just did a PhD in engineering. Now I'm on the side of the mountain in Mongolia, and I'm running around, and I'm finding things in the roots of trees, and my feet are crunching underneath me, and we pull up the grass just a little bit, and right under the grass roots, you see the remains of what looks like this roof, a series of roofs buried in the roots of trees right underneath us, right where that anomaly had sent us, in the center of a forbidden precinct. Now, the main results of that find uh, you know, were mostly embargoed, uh, but we did find bits of horse bone that date to exactly the time of Genghis Khan's death, lots of horse bones, uh, lots of lacquer and a little bits of ceramic and things like this, but we didn't dig because uh, that's not what we were supposed to do. We were just supposed to you know, identify it. And then we used ground penetrating radar, magnetometry, and all these other tools to try to sift through it. But what really got to me was the individual story. I learned something about a person who went to their lowest point. I mean, we've all experienced those moments, right? Those moments where you, you got nothing left. I mean, there's, there's been one or two in my life, for sure, where you're at the very, 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 very bottom of your existence. And it might be that in those moments, we get to some kind of euphoric state. Who knows? Something. The breakthrough. I mean, this whole thing about memes. I read a lot about Richard Dawkins and memes. I also talked to my uh, friend and colleague, uh, a good friend named V.S. Ramachandran, a neuroscientist. Does anybody know that name? He wrote Phantom in the Brain. Remarkable individual. He says that you know, there's some basic instincts that we pull from more than just what we find attractive around us. But, but what creates those moments where we don't care about that anymore? We don't care what people say around us. We don't care what's expected of us anymore. We just don't care to the point in which we can change our fate. It might be those low points. I found another individual, I gotta go a little faster here, uh, in the jungles of Mexico recently. This is a guy by the name of Sky Witness. And uh, Dr. Vera Tisler from Ina is showing me his skull where he's got two big marks on the top of his head where they've been depressed from some kind of battle. And then he's looking at, she's looking at the, her, his femur on his left leg where he's survived uh, some kind of major injury. And she tells me she knows who this person's name is, Lord Sky Witness, because this was found in his burial. Does anybody know what this is? It's pretty brutal. This is a bloodletting device that was found next to his crotch. Uh, this, you can see it's five meters, uh, it's five centimeters, uh, the marker there. That was used to experience pain through his penis. It was this thing where he would let blood out in a public ceremony. Uh, it's, it's well documented in the Maya glyphs. Uh, to show this relationship to some other state, whatever it is, in extreme pain, uh, and this relationship to the spirits, to gods, whatever it is, and then they would burn the blood. But this would go through his body in the most sensitive place. But that one person would go on, we think, based off of some early findings of other uh, glyphs uh, that have been decoded by a guy by the name of Simon Martin, that this guy, Lord Witness, if that truly is him, might have been the guy who took down T. Call. Uh, you know, and, and basically shut them down for about 100 years. Tikal is the capital of, the, uh, of what was once the sort of epicenter of the Maya world. Uh, and, and it's an amazing place, but it's only becoming truly understood even in the last couple of years. Although this place has been one of the most excavated sites or well-surveyed uh, sites in Maya archaeology, it's just in the last few years that a group of Incredible archaeologists have commissioned a huge data set of LIDAR to be flown over this, uh, over this jungle uh, and commissioned it through a group called Pakunam. And what they do with the LIDAR data is that you can shoot a laser beam over the sky at a million points per second, flying around in a circle, and you can see that most of the laser hits the top of the trees, but a lot of it you, hits the ground. And you can just take that bottom layer and delete the rest, and all of a sudden you get a map of the world as you never saw before as once was. So you can go from trees to no trees with a snap of a finger. 
This is completely changing how archaeology is done, in the jungle at least. All of a sudden, you see the world. In fact, just this last year, they found two new pyramids at T. Call. I was there. I was there with the map and a machete. You can literally throw a rock almost, well, not almost. It's almost like a core, it's like you feel like you could throw a rock, but you're right next to the main pathways of T. Call. They didn't even know it was there. Over the last couple of years, I've had this incredible honor of going around with this group of just true explorers, uh, led by these maps on their phones, uh, on their iPads, on whatever they are, looking to see where they are, and then bushwhacking through the jungles to try to see what's really there. Sometimes we take helicopters. Sometimes we take boats. I mean, it's really Look at that, look at that. We are in a river, in a storm, it is soaking wet. We got a guy bailing water out the back. Oh, man. This is what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's like my favorite way to live, right? Uh, that's going up a river, a river between Guatemala and Mexico with archaeologist uh, from Brown University, Omar Alcavar, uh, on the right there and his crew, and the rain just opens out of nowhere all the time. I mean, the conditions are intense. You're really on the edge. Uh, you know, you get to places like this. Okay. Here's where you we can enter see the how jungle. thick the jungle is, and it's going straight up. It'll be steep, and then start a flat, and very steep again. Uh, and we're going. We gotta go. Hola, amigos. We have machetes. We have that totally useless, uh, well, mostly useless uh, anti-venom. Uh, and then we have this digital map created from lasers in the sky. And over the last couple of years, these archaeologists have found so many things. They found over 60,000 new Mayan structures the last time I checked. And I've been there to be the first at a new pyramid, you know, uh, a pyramid that might have been looted or might not have been looted for one reason or another, but you find them for the first time known to science. These pyramids inside them, they're like onions. And you go inside these pyramids, and all of a sudden you see that each layer of the pyramid is built upon the other, representing a different time. Uh, you know, and then and this would have been the outside of a pyramid at one point. And then it gets covered, it gets covered, and it gets covered through time to build the next dynasty. But what's also interesting is that every time the archaeologists do their survey, they have to go and backfill them. So a lot of times you'll never see them again, other than the drawings. Well, we use things like, let's say, Xbox Connect sensor, uh, and, or photogrammetry, or other types of low-cost tools, and we can create these 3D models, these virtual reality models of the insides of these pyramids and bring them out, uh, out of the jungle. One of the coolest things I ever saw uh, was discovered in 2005, uh, and now it has a building around it, in this totally, um, totally not a discreet building, you've got, uh, you've got inside there the only, most of the Maya art that you see in the world is, is stuff that represents the, the lives of the kings and queens, what they really wanted to show as their world. But inside that is the only known image of daily life. And uh, they gave us access to this just last week or a couple of weeks ago. And we're in there, uh, and you can see you know, a woman uh, with tattoos around her ankles, uh, a, a, a big earring uh, that would have created this almost a like gape in her ear, uh, carrying something that they think is uh, a pole or a maize drink. And you can see the difference between her and the person that's working for her. She's got a smaller bracelet. She doesn't have any tattoos. You start to get the sense of like what, you know, the sort of like the experience of culture is not that different than it was, you know, some thousand years ago, maybe more. Like this. This is pretty remarkable. They think this was, this was created sometime around 600 to 700 AD. And yet, when I walk around the streets of Mexico today, I see the same thing. A woman selling tamales. Well, a man eats them. Tamales. Yeah, tamales. Actually, the creator god for the Maya was the maize god who came out with tamales. Uh, that's it's still true today. The, but one thing that's really cool is that they're just finding out more about the actual spirit world of the Maya. And there's a man named Guillermo Dianda, who's a good friend of mine, uh, who's been leading this charge to go dive down into these holes 
that just pop up around the Yucatan. Right around all these Maya pyramids, you see these random holes. And you drop down into these holes, you descend about 30 meters off the surface, you're hot, you're so hot, because you're in the jungle, but you're wearing a wetsuit. And the next thing you know, uh, you're in this other world, this system of rivers that winds its way through the Yucatan. And Guillermo and his team have just connected what they think to be uh, the world's largest underground cave system that runs over 215 miles or roughly 350 kilometers as a connected cave. And they think that this cave goes right down to the very center of Chichen Itza under the main pyramid there, but they haven't been able to find the, the, the portal to that hole yet. So they're right at the edge or searching for it. But as they're going, they're risking their lives because underwater cave diving is literally the most dangerous thing I've ever done. And Right when we were there, the guy who was my safety diver said that just the day before he had pulled two bodies out of the cave, uh, had died 24 hours earlier, but the little shrimp that were in there uh, had basically taken those divers down to bone in, one, in 24 hours. Now, the ancient Maya used those caves also as these portals. Uh, and what we find down there are captured in this suspended moment uh, a world of belief uh, because they believe that from those caves emerged life, and so that to go back down into those caves is to go back to the spirit world. I do think that this is another great frontier of my archaeology. I gotta go faster now. Uh, we might skip the one of the last sections. This is, this is uh, going into the island of Micronesia. I promise I'd take you to the Pacific. This is my uh, director totally passed out because it's exhausting. Uh, as you can see, we start to get to these beautiful islands. Around the islands of Micronesia are more than just those little stone carvings. I saw something there that completely boggled the mind. Emerging out of the jungle is this world that, that makes you almost imagine a, a, a different human experience. Look at those stones, those massive basalt stones. We're on water. How did those stones get there? How could they have moved them in mass to build this world called Nan Madol? What are those stones, these mysterious stones? It's actually just now in the last couple of years been named a World Heritage Site, but has been barely really known. It was a place that was occupied by somebody known as the Saudelur Dynasty, somewhere around 1200 to 1600 AD, they think. Uh, but this place is intense. I mean, we're in the middle of the ocean. It rains 325 inches a year. It is brutally hot. How did they move those stones into place and from where? I mean, without anything other than willpower. This is where they are. You can see this is uh, a, a map from NASA of uh, the weather currents through the year. Uh, Micronesia is, and Pompeii, where the island is right in the middle of that dot. Uh, when explorers first found this, uh, they famously thought, like, well, they must have come from Chile and populated Oceania, because there's a whole string of islands across there. But it was, it was Captain Cook who, uh, from Cook Island who, who started listening to the languages that were spoken around the region and, and realized that, that people were really, they think, originating from the Philippines, and that somehow they had figured out how to sail with incredible precision against the wind to populate this world across the oceans, island to island to island to island. Now, not only is that skill, but talk about bravery, because they think that some, at least half of them didn't make it anywhere. Like, imagine just sailing into the sunset with hope constantly as your culture. That's remarkable. I, uh, I wanted to get to this site, but to follow the traditions of uh, the Pompeians, I had to go through the ritual rites to even get access to the site, which is still overseen uh, by the specific tribe of what are called the Namarkis, who took over the, who actually conquered the, the Saddlers. And that rite involves a crazy drink uh, built out of something called kava plant. So here's just, I'm going to play a video, so it might be loud, so I don't want to shock anybody again. So this is uh, ar archaeologist uh, Gus Kohler, uh, who's directing the conservation preservation effort at, for the island of, or for the Federated States of Micronesia. This is and our he's getting language. me ready. So, so what, what is the language? Uh, Pontin. And what, what am I supposed to say to the chief? Uh, what does that mean? Uh, Monsap is 
you're referring to the IG, right? mm. but they're, because we believe they're invasive, they're always, you talk to them in plural, as if you're talking to two people, because he's got a spirit with them, so Monsabogo is two, like two non marquis but because he's the chief, you know, you always, we have an honorific language, you always refer to them in a plural. I'm a little intimidated. Are you ready for this? Let's give it a go. Yeah. Okay, can I get uh, some... I noticed a guy about to show up with a machete in his hand. Yeah. I gave it back to you. Yeah, the pigs back. over there. It's very much like that. If I right, see one like, like that, yeah. it's all yours. All right, I'll point it out. Yeah, yeah. make sure you okay. do. Right? They're ready. Yeah, okay. okay. Big guy with a machete, a chief, a weird ceremony. This is like, uh, you know, it's like beams are made of. Uh, I get oiled up and I meet with the chief who's in a trance-like state. Uh, and I have to drink this thing called Sakao, which is pounded by rocks. The, the first person to drink it uh, af after me is our sound recordist. I mean, it makes your whole face numb. It really does. Uh, and if you have as much as I had, uh, it literally makes you cross-eyed. Like, you can't see anything. You're, you're essentially blind. But this isn't just for TV. I mean, it really is part of the tradition. Uh, and, and it's something that happens by pounding this kava root uh, over stones. And you hear, listen to that bell. It's a bell. On these specific stones that they, that they describe as almost bells ringing in the society, the group around them. Uh, and they would, everybody in the neighborhood would hear these bells. And as you walk through the island of Pompeii, you hear these bells sort of chiming all over the place because every single thing that happens on that island begins with a sakao ceremony. And after those roots are pounded into that pulp, they're put through this hibiscus leaf, and that's what you get. And that's what you have to drink. Otherwise, you're rude. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I don't, I don't know. You know, but you go for it. You go for it. Uh, and it's not, it's not that it's some sensational thing. This is their deep culture, the point in which the state flag of Pompeii has a sakao cup at its center. It is the center part of every decision they make as a government, as a people, whether or not we're allowed to go to that island or not. On the far reaches of islands that neighbor Pompeii, we find other evidence of these same sakao stones. This is Rosa, the chief of a small atoll called Ant, Ant Atoll, and he knows from his own childhood, and he directed us to this, this sakao stone, one of many that were in that little plot area there, those stones didn't come from that island. They all came from this one center place because they all originate in something quite remarkable, this big volcanic plug, uh, and they were brought all around the region. We take our, our technology. This is uh, a group called Visual Skies, an incredible group of guys that, that go out into the world with me and build the most incredible scanning models of these different locations. Uh, this is us getting ready with our little LiDAR drone. I want to show you the LiDAR drone real quick. You can see there the spinning blade uh, underneath that little spinning thing. That's shooting millions of points right now of lasers through the jungle. And as you punch through the jungle, you, you're looking for things like this, this ancient world lost in the undergrowth. And through removing the trees, you can start to pull together a bigger map of what's there. And the whole point of this is that when you build that all together, you can sort of just brush away the trees and see what was once there try to go through this mangrove, start to identify bit by bit by bit how big this world really, really was. And it was enormous. It was enormous. A feat of engineering, a feat of imagination. I don't know how to quite describe this, but it just boggles the imagination to think that those stones were placed there, but not were the only place there. The only place where they occur naturally on the island is a volcanic plug on the other side of the island. And that's about 22 kilometers or 20 kilometers in distance as the crow flies. How did they get those huge stones over there? Why did they do it? I don't know. Why did they do that? Why does that happen? But they built a world that we think looked like this once. Is that leadership? Is that imagination, curiosity, charisma? Is that, is that insecurity? What is that? Whatever it is, it's something that you don't see as an anomaly alone. You see those, that tradition of, of culture spread across Oceana. Not just in those, I mean, there are other big buildings like that built out of, sakao, uh, out of, out of basalt stones, but that, that culture of kava root or sakao, that sort of tradition of pounding the stones and then drinking this hallucinogenic or narcotic, sort of hallucinogenic drink uh, to make decisions with, that exists all the way out in Fiji across the whole region. 
Given that we don't have time, I'm going to have to skip this section, which is, uh, which is really fun. I'll just show you this one section. This is Colombia. Uh, this is what it feels like in the jungles of Colombia. Uh, and I'm there with uh, this incredible archaeologist, Santiago Gerardo, uh, who's been at a site called Ciudad Perdida. We use the same technology. We map through uh, the, the jungle, uh, and we're able to delete the trees and find these pathways pathways of a group known as the Tyrona all through the jungles, hike to those different locations and find these little bits of ceramic lost up in the mountains that are these signs that somebody once lived there. Nobody's been there for hundreds of years, maybe more, at least since the time of the Spaniards probably. The Spaniards, again, came through and wiped it all out uh, with their disease. Actually, not just their disease, but their, but their, uh, their greed. They saw these little bits of gold, uh, you know, these, 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 these fragments of, uh, of, of imagination, again, built by the Tyrona uh, with these incredible details. I mean, look at that. Look at that work. Look, that's my finger there, so you can see how tiny that is. And they thought this was gold, but actually it was even more sophisticated because the Tyrona had figured out how to gold plate through this chemical process. And they had little bits of gold, and they were able to craft these things and gold plate these things. So while the, the Spanish were like, oh, we're going to go get all this gold, they actually just were disappointed because they only got these like, very lightly gold plated things. But it was their greed that led to the diseases that spread and really wiped these people out, of which there still are descendants. There's these people known, uh, many, a couple of three tribes or so. This is a Kogi priest uh, known as Amamo, uh, who describes his world as coming from Mother Earth, that he is the elder brother, where are the little brothers, uh, and that every part of that Earth has some kind of relationship uh, to the spirit world. What's remarkable for this guy is that he lives in one of the most diverse ecological climates in the world, going from sea level to the base of, essentially the altitude of the base of Everest, uh, his base camp, uh, you know, with these snow-capped mountains over the matter of very, very few miles. Uh, and, and, like, and when you look at his hat on the top, the little white hat, it actually represents the snow caps. And the one thing he had for me to say to the rest of the world, I asked him, what do you want me to say to the rest of the world? He says, the snow's melting. Now, I thought that was interesting because I've been looking at like all those cultures and the things that have happened, the expansion contractions of different moments in time. Uh, this is the uh, uh, climate data, and you can see a drop in temperature around this period here. Some historians actually believe this has to do with mass depopulation uh, that came out of plagues. So you get like this world order, a globalization, and then you get uh, you know Genghis Khan, the bubonic plague, and then you get the Spaniards over here, and boom, boom, boom. And the decrease in population isn't small. I mean, we're talking quarter to half of the population of any place that this stuff happens to. So, I mean, huge numbers of people die uh, in these plague situations, and it's not to be taken lightly. It's a, it is not jokingly aside a timely warning for us. But it also talks about these, these different annealing moments. Um, like I said, Genghis Khan had that moment crushed and then came through. I had one of those. And this is maybe where I really wanted to get to. Uh, about three and a half years ago, I found myself crushed under a vehicle. This was my leg. Boom. Gone. They cut it off. It was Halloween, so my kids and I made a costume out of it. See, I have a prosthetic leg, right? It's been incredible. It's been a great joy, actually, uh, because I've got to see the world, you can see it again, as a, uh, as a part future, part past, you know? It's been, it's been, a, it's been a, a wonderful experience. I know that's weird to say. Uh, I mean, all those travels I just talked to you about happened after I lost my leg. Uh, and except for the Genghis Khan part. And, uh, and it's been an expedition into both my physical nature but also my mind. I had this moment where I, I started feeling incredible pain in a part of my body that didn't exist anymore. And that's how I met this man named Ramachandran, P.S. Ramachandran, who had discovered this thing uh, where you could use, he calls it mirror therapy, where you could stick a mirror between your arms and you can release the sensation of a clinching feeling in the, in the phantom part of your body that doesn't exist physically, but fully exists mentally. The pain that I was feeling in my leg was so significant that I literally 
at one point thought I rather would have died than continue on with this much pain. And yet there was nothing I could do about it. There was no opioids or anything like this. Because I mean, literally, there's nothing there. You can't scratch it. You can't pound it. There's nothing. There's, the only things I started feeling was through meditation and then truly just like welcoming the pain. That's what kind of helped to leave it a little bit in these flash moments. It was this understanding of the mind. We started looking around at all these different things, like kundalini yoga, all this other stuff to try to get my mind to release. And as we used those mirrors, every time you'd pull the mirror away, the pain would come back. The mirror would go, you'd put it there, and then between my legs, and I would see the leg again, the pain would go away, pulls the mirror away, the pain would come back. So we started looking at what makes the brain, what, what makes the mind? Where does the body end and begin? Uh, and, and he started thinking about, well, what, what has been done in other areas where reality is shifted? Depression, PTSD, these sorts of things. And there was a study going on at Johns Hopkins where they were using uh, a magic mushroom to try to get people that were suffering from terminally, uh, terminal uh, diagnosis and cancer to rethink their world. So we tried that. And sure enough, one heavy dose of magic mushrooms with the mirrors, and it was gone. It was gone forever. Uh, I think what happens is that the mind, in that state, frees itself. In fact, there's, uh, there's a lot of research here now. This was published uh, actually in the, uh, the Journal of Royal Society Interface where, uh, uh, by Giovanni Petri, not me, this is another researcher uh, and a, and a well-known group that did fMRI brain scanning of 15 people under the effects of psilocybin, and they found this concept of hyperconnectivity, connecting parts of the brain that were no longer connected, increasing the, increasing the activity of the brain to a point in which you might imagine something new. A colleague of mine at UCSD now, in a group that we've launched called, uh, it's called the uh, PHRI, or the Psychedelic Health Research Initiative, uh, has been doing this work with Buddhist monks, where he thinks that you're actually, he's a neuroscientist, where, and he directs the Center for Mindfulness. But under deep mindfulness meditation, they've been finding that there's a regulation of, the, of, of pain through the thalamus, which isn't the same thing as your opioid receptor. It's something completely different than how we currently treat pain today. But I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm an engineer. So I started getting all excited about what kinds of sensors I could wear while I was experiencing these different types of meditation or these different kinds of things. We were coming up with experiments. This is two people wearing accelerometers and heart rate variability sensors as they're moving around. We're seeing if we can start to build experiments where we can start to see and visualize and measure people in their other states. You know, these states that might be induced by some kind of thing like chanting or, 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 or psilocybin or other things. This is my colleague who's now at the University of Arts London uh, directing uh, uh, an effort there, uh, Sheldon Brown. And we're, we're wearing a bunch of sensors looking like dorks. Uh, but having a good time with a drum, and, uh, and those sensors include uh, these low-level EEGs. We're trying to get increasingly high-level EEGs, uh, and as I get into a trance-like state by trying to get really into the music, maybe these visualizations that Sheldon built that react to my, uh, to, to my brain waves go deeper and deeper into that model that he's building, uh, so I, I get this effect of trying to go deeper into my trance state. Now, what am I saying here? Altered states of consciousness provide the deconstruction of ego. What is ego? Ego is this understanding of where I am, who I am, and how the world relates to me. And I think that just like for Genghis Khan, just like for that guy, Lord Sky Witness, who would feel that pain, or just like for really anybody that has imagined something new, these altered states, whatever they are, a deep meditation, a prayer, a song, a chant, a kiss, that moment where you forgot yourself, you don't care about the meme, you don't care about what you copy, you're in a free state. That might be what we call the, the destruction of ego. In neuroscience, they're calling it the end of the default mode network. <laughs> Is this an imagination lever that we have stumbled across just by accident and they sort of build across in all the different things that we have around us today? Like this lecture, is this a technology that we came up with to try to get into that kind of state? The, the chanting of a gospel choir, the singing of a gospel choir before the sermon comes, is that to get them into that state? You know, the, the idea of a hadra or the, the whirling dervish. 
Is that, is that to get us into those states before some other message can maybe hold on more tightly? Or if there is no other message, if there is no other mirror, then is that where the new ideas are born? Have the ecologies of altered states influenced the diversity of culture that we see today? Everywhere in the world that I've been, there's been these kinds of experiences uh, that have been rooted in the history of those landscapes. They've also been rooted in the types of plants that grow. You've got fly agaric as a mushroom that grows up in the north. Up, up by the reindeer people, you've got uh, you know, ayahuasca and San Pedro that has been deeply connected to the cultures of the South. Do those somehow influence the world that we see today? Is that, have we taken for granted that the visual effects or the mental effects that have been associated with the ecologies of, and the access to different kinds of plants and the, and the things that we've stumbled across of as, as technologies to those altered states might have actually influenced in some small way or in some way the art that we have around us today. You know, I went to Varanasi uh, in India where uh, the men and women of the Hindu religion go deep, deep, deep into their innermost self to try to let go of pain. This is where they, they wade into the banks of the Ganga River and they, and they bring their dead, to burn their dead, uh, because they think that if you d burn your dead there, then, then they'll, they'll skip the processes of reincarnation and go to enlightenment. There you find sadhus and, and others that have given up all worldly things. And in the ancient Vedic traditions, you have stories of the soma drink. You know, this, in fact, the ninth mantra is, 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 is entirely dedicated to this god of this hallucinogenic drink, essentially, uh, which they don't quite know what, it, what it's made of. But it's described as something that rules over the mind uh, and actually uh, releases you uh, to this otherworldly blissful state. Uh, is that what created the kind of sort of visual effects of the art that we had today? Are there some characteristics of the art in India that might reflect the types of things that were in that drink early on and the things that people had access to? When I was up there in Peru and that man was, my mountain guide was blowing on the coca leaves. This is an ancient ethnogenic tra tradition. This is, this is something called punke, uh, this act of spiritual re reciprocity to the mountain where he blows it to the sky. But then he also was saying, I'm praying to San Pedro. When I was standing at the, uh, at the side of Machu Picchu with the director of archaeology for Machu Picchu, Jose Bastantanti, he described to me that this whole landscape, he believes, was a ritual center and that each one of these terraces was covered in rape, uh, a certain type of plant uh, medicine, uh, San Pedro, the psychedelic cactus, ayahuasca, uh, and other types of plant medicines that have been deeply connected to those cultures uh, through time. You go to the very heart of, of uh, Machu Picchu, and there is this thing uh, that nobody has access to anymore because apparently some like ad company broke part of it uh, while trying to shoot a commercial. But we got access to it, and it's, uh, and it's this, this rock that they think is the top of the bedrock, carved as this portal, possibly. Nobody really knows what it is. You know, Hiram Bingham called it a hitching post to the sun. Uh, and, uh, and Johann Reinhard said that it was this connection to a mountain, the, the main mountain off to the side. But all you know is that Machu Picchu is surrounded by this river, and, it, and, it's, and it's this, in the same way that Varanasi is surrounded by this river, and it's this central, almost like a, a spiritual portal for the people of the ancient mountains there in the Andes. Uh, and that the world that they had is one that they still feel today. This is uh, another site not so far away where this local shaman is performing a San Pedro ceremony around this uh, semi-destroyed uh, piece of archaeology there that's on the side of this uh, Inca staircase. And it's been blown up by miners uh, in the last hundred years. But he described it as a, uh, as a portal to the next dimension. I go back to Chan Chan. I look at those, those really, those really kind of geometric, weird, uh, I don't know how to describe this other than as trippy, uh, um, peng uh, what are these, um, seagulls. I mean, they look trippy to me. Uh, and, and you think about what happened here. From this exact room, it was the central internal spiritual space uh, for Chan Chan. From that room, most likely the procession to lead towards the sacrificing of those children, uh, that's where it started. Uh, in this little uh, like inner sanctuary. And then they'd go out to the main plaza, and then they would lead the procession out for their eventual death. Uh, their traditions were tied 100% to the changing of the moon uh, and their relationship to 
uh, the plants and cactuses they had around them. I'm going to fly through here a little more, and I'm just going to show that this is the kind of thing that we see today. Does this have some influence? Do these types of arts and types of culture have some influence of the types of drugs that people had around them at the time, or entheogens? And I go back to this idea of the world that we see. When I was in uh, Micronesia, the decisions that were made were made purely by an altered state. Every decision in that government is made during this cacao ceremony, from you know, whether or not you're going to allow somebody to get married or whether or not you're going to start a new farm. Uh, and then you go back in culture all the way to the time of you know, uh, the Oracle of Delphi, and you think about the kinds of historical context that that tells. You know, an idea that the most powerful woman in the Greek world was a woman who was ruling for about a thousand years as a priestess who would get chosen out of the public, would sit on a golden tripod, look into a gold bowl uh, filled with water, hold some leaf, they think it was bay leaf, and smell the fumes that would emerge out of a crack in the earth and go into a trance-like state to answer yes or no questions from the public one day a month, nine months out of the year that would define the fate of the Greek world. What I'm saying here and why I bring this stuff up is that I don't think that we remember that these altered states have been such an important part of our human imagination through time. It's not saying that they're good or bad. They could lead to bad things, too. It could be brainwashing that leads to war, all these other things, too. Uh, but they, they have been ingrained into the randomness, the magic that might be related to, you know, or similar, parallel to the idea of the mutations and reshuffling in genes but the reshuffling and mutations of ideas in society. And that the society that we see around us, the technologies that we see around us that get us into those, as, uh, as the uh, psychologist Michaeli, Csikszent Michaeli calls it, flow states, those things might be very well trying to touch upon that same feeling of ecstasy that might be where we get all of our craziness from. So what's next? Where do cultures go? We're going towards this kind of monoculture, uh, people say there's 7,000 languages as of a couple of, uh, my friend wrote uh, as of 10 years ago, and of which one dies every two weeks. We're shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And each one of those cultures, as they die, they take away with them this deep experiment in the human condition. Because each one of those languages carries an understanding of who we are, how we could exist, the kinds of perceptions that we have. I had a chance to talk to, uh, actually he's a friend of mine, uh, Vint Cerf. He, he's credited as one of the three people that founded the internet. If you can make sense of that enigma on the board, then let me know, because I don't know what that means. But, uh, but he, he told me that the thing that he fears most is not that we lose our, necessarily, you know, our humanity, uh, but that we forget it. He called it information decay. Uh, that the process of slow decay of our knowledge is like the burning of Alexandria, but we don't even remember it. We don't even realize it's there. Imagine right now trying to open a computer from 15 years ago and get a file out of it that you can do something meaningful with. Imagine 100 years from now trying to find somebody who can open a JPEG or remembers what that even means. So with time, we have this loss of knowledge, and the only thing we can do is try to remember to be inspired. The last thing I wanted to do, and this is the very last thing, I'm 15 minutes over, is I wanted to play you uh, the sound of the drums that I heard uh, in Mongolia after my very first expedition. Oh, no, my very last expedition there in 2011. It was the very end of this four-year process, and these seven shamans pulled up on the side of this mountain, uh, and they were there for their own reasons, uh, and they didn't know why we were there. You know, nobody's supposed to be there. Uh, and, and my colleague, uh, Professor Istorch from the International Association for Mongol Studies, comes up to me and says, Albert, the head shaman wants to see you. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, and he goes, he wants to judge your soul. I'm like, oh, man. You know, uh, you have to go to him at sundown. You have to say these words, and then you have to sit at this shrine while he talks to you. He would be there to translate uh, from English to Mongolian, and then there would be another guy to translate from Mongolian to ancient uh, Proto-Mongolian, and then and that he would understand. And I couldn't take a video; I just could record the sounds. And this is the sounds uh, of that drum. Okay. So we sat at this shrine, and he beat this drum over my head. He had uh, feathers 
that went up over, over his face like this, and then he had this big band across his eyes. His band uh, was, was around his forehead. They're painted with these big, bright, wide open eyes that stared at you like you were, uh, like you were transfixed in this moment of judgment. Uh, and, then, and then beneath that were these dreadlocks that hung down across his face. They would just hang there. Uh, and so then he would dance around you, beating this drum. Boom, boom. There was, I remember it, there was these little, little bells that dangled off of him in all directions. And, and as he beat that drum, it got faster and faster. He moved around. And I'm sitting there on the ground, petrified, waiting for this moment to end. And it just gets more and more and more intense. As the beating grows in speed, so does my heartbeat. I am transfixed in his heartbeat. I am sitting there in a moment of total awe, and then he just hits this climax and then collapses to the ground. And he's sitting there and he's sort of twitching. And, and you can't see his face because the dreadlocks are covering his eyes. And his attendant hands him something that he drinks under, under the veil of these, this, this face shield. And he starts talking in tongues. And he's asking me who, you know, why I'm there, what, what I'm there for. He's trying to know my intentions. Uh, it was hard because I was translating back and forth. So I would give these long-winded answers, and they'd be translated two times over, and then it'd be like one word back. Uh, so I knew it wasn't making its mark. Finally, he said that I was sent to that mountain uh, for a purpose that he thought was OK, that if I followed my intentions and they were meaningful to the, the, the survival of the culture uh, and to try to bring knowledge to the world, and that those intentions were OK, that he accepted it. But to me, that moment that he found himself completely in a state of total trance and had taken me to that same moment I reflect upon now when I wonder about the future of our planet and I wonder about the process of our cultural diversity evolving from different things, I think about that one central concept of imagination, the wonder, the magic, the mystique, the enchantment, the things that go beyond what we can really truly explain and we can just sort of call imagination. Uh, and I think that the things that we've stumbled across of that we call culture, the art, the chanting, the sound of that drum, uh, they reflect that magic in all of us. So thank you very, very much. Oh. I, I want to say one last thing. I've got a lot of people to thank. Uh, my mother, my father, uh, and most of all, my two little kitties, who this whole imagination thing is for. Thank you very much indeed uh, for, for fascinating images and insight and journey, and for coming to Cambridge here to be with us tonight. Now. A lot of people have been, uh, you know, this is the last lecture in this series on enigmas. It's the 35th series of Darwin College lectures. It's not quite the end yet because many of you have been asking me over recent weeks, what's the theme for next year? What is 2021 going to bring? Now, the first theme was origins. And think, since then, we've had color and time and plagues and migration, and what, so what's next year? So I've been saying, of course, I couldn't possibly say, but tonight I can. So you've all been really interested week by week, and if you want to see any of these, again, uh, they're mostly uh, on, online, they're on YouTube, and I gather as of today, there's been over 300,000 viewings of this in this last, over these last two months. So, see them online again if you want to. So, next year, what is it? Is it diversity? 
endings. Well, we've had some pretty bloody things today, and uh, we've had bloodletting, but that's not what it is next year. It's actually blood. Next year, until next January. Thank you, everyone.